Happy Wednesday, good people of Earth. Happy Hump Day. However you uh, like to think about your Wednesday in that middle of the of the week portion. Um, it's glad to be here with you. My name is Emil Williams Jr. And it's time for episode 12 of the PWBA podcast. And uh, boy, it has been going on uh, uh, rapidly. I would say Aaron Smith already 12 episodes in. Uh, we've got another great guest, of course, as well. We don't want to spill the beans, but if you've been following, of course, on PWA Social, you know exactly who today's guest is, and we'll have some cool video to introduce her. But first and foremost, Aaron, what's going on today? How are you? Doing well, Emil. Thank you, as always. Uh, we actually just had uh, the emergency sirens going off in the area. So Okay, I, I thought I heard something, but I didn't want to, you know, what was going down. So is everything okay? Well, was, they knew who was on the PWBA podcast as well. So they were just alerting everybody that it's time to tune in. So uh, now everything's good, you know, just the, you know, daily debate now on whether, whether or not I want to cut my own hair, the pros and cons and all that stuff. Uh, but other than that, uh, that's a hard no for me personally. That, that's a I, no. I, I, I'm definitely leaning. <laughs> I, I, there's more cons than pros at the moment. So, uh, but other than that, I'm all good. Once again, excited for another uh, another another episode here, and hope all is well in uh, Chicago land. It, it is so far. It seems like a good day outside. Uh, our guest can can also confirm that just on the other side of town uh, in just a second. So, without further ado, uh, Aaron, what do we have lined up to to get our viewers excited about our guest? Uh, we're actually going to go to a winning moment from the 2017 U.S. Women's Open. So if we do this right, we should be able to play this. Uh, so just a nice little video from Jason Thomas for Liz's sixth USWO. Looking for a 22nd career title, a 10th major, her sixth overall possibly, and four in a row. Can she complete the feat today? Here in the Dallas Metroplex. Let's find out. Dave Ryan on the call. CBS Sports Network. Looks good. It is good. Saw through the rack. Ten back in the pit. One more victory. Magnificent. 22nd career title, 10th major. And for the sixth time in her glorious career. Storm Nation. Mom, Dad, I love you. Tata, I wish you were here. I love you. I am standing here with the, the most amazing bowler I have ever seen grace the lanes, Liz Johnson. Liz, I want you to take everybody back to 1996 when you won your first U.S. Open. And how does that compare to 2017? I'm just a little bit older. <laughs> um, every U.S. Open was special, you know, uh, taken back to Indianapolis Market Square Arena. You know, I made my first U.S. Open show, and uh, here I am now in 2017 with number six. I mean, it's, it's just a dream. I mean, you can't put into words how unbelievable this is. There it is. Big thanks to Jason Thomas for putting those together, and uh, without further ado... The legend, Liz Johnson. Let's bring her into the broadcast. Lizzie J. Hi, guys. Thanks for having me today. Uh, uh, thank you. Thanks for spending some time with us. Um, always, a, always a pleasure that those moments don't get old, uh, at least from us watching it. And obviously, I'd assume same thing on your end. Uh, just just look, thinking back to that clip, what, what emotions uh, did you feel looking at that? Uh, they were just... Uh, I just remember being just incredibly happy, incredibly humbled, and just couldn't believe it was a, a sixth title. I actually was watching a clip from uh, my very first one uh, in Market Square Arena last night, and I couldn't believe you know, it was, I was 22 years old and actually showed no emotion back then probably. And, <laughs> and it's like as you get older, you just, appreci you just appreciate it more, but you just um, – it just – it just sticks with you and um you know you just appreciate every single little thing especially what's going on now you appreciate every little thing that you have and and what i've done in my career well we want to say uh first thank you again um happy belated birthday mm -hmm. uh, your birthday was may 2nd um so we got to ask you uh and it looked like on social media that you guys were able to put together uh, a pretty solid quarantine birthday. So how did things go for, for your quarantine birthday? 
Oh, it was actually, uh, it was a pretty uh, laid back day. Uh, it was it was sunny and 70 degrees outside. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful day, beautiful weekend. So we did some yard work and kind of hung out and, you know, nothing, nothing crazy, but just enjoyed the outdoors and um, just, you know, kind of another day, but uh, it was just, it was kind of a nice relaxing day too. And we had to spend time, um, you know, out, outside and, and with the puppies too. The puppies enjoyed it. Uh, Puppies don't know the quarantine. They're going to go crazy, if, uh, <laughs> you know, once you start leaving again. So <laughs> That's a great point. Um, first, I want to say um, thanks to everyone watching on Bold TV. As always, uh, you're going to please sure to uh, drop a few questions uh, in the chat for Liz. We will get to those uh, when we have a few moments uh, within the broadcast. Uh, besides, of course, uh, celebrating birthdays and, you know, obviously uh, we should be bowling at this moment. So how have you been staying busy during these uh, last couple of months? And yeah, I think you just told us a, a brief story before we got on air about uh, there, there may have been a, an animal or two that, that doesn't belong uh, in the house as well. Yeah, we um, probably in uh, mid to late March, more mid-March, we you know, just kind of hanging out in the, in the house and a couple of times uh, had one of the dogs uh, sitting with me and I'm like, what the heck is that noise? And, you know, had some um, stuff walk, like it was walking on the roof and uh, we had had a pest control guy come and I uh, said, we think we got raccoons, um, maybe squirrels, maybe something else, but it, it ended up being raccoons. Um, we trapped, we trapped the father. Um, and try to get the mom. Uh, finally, uh, as of last uh, last week, Friday and Saturday, we trapped uh, three babies and never got the mom. I caught the mom at 6 a.m. right outside my house uh, in the in the top floor next to literally like right next to our bathroom, um, but never could catch her. But uh, the babies were in there, and uh, it's like they were so cute. But yeah, it was it was time for them to leave. So um, finally, it's it's been nice and quiet they've been so loud and uh it was just uh we were a little worried about uh what kind of damage they do to the house but uh hopefully it's very minimal and um it's been quiet thank god well one thing we've been uh that, that's a little bit, bit more exciting than some of the things we've had going on here at least in texas as our at our house so uh gl glad we haven't had anything quite like that but uh, one thing we've been doing to keep busy is uh, on the PWBA's social media channels. We've been uh, going through the Ultimate Queens Bracket Challenge, and as a two-time winner of the event, uh, obviously you've been involved since uh, the very first round, and you're actually uh, in a matchup with Shannon O'Keefe right now to move to the Final Four. Uh, and it's very close, folks, so if you want to get on social while we're watching here, uh, certainly vote on Twitter, Facebook story, Instagram story, but uh, Liz, obviously the Queen's a, a big major. I got to watch you win your first one in 2009 in Reno. Uh, what were some of your favorite moments from your uh, two wins? From my Queen's moments? Mm -hmm. Yep. Probably, um, yeah, just winning, winning the Queen's in, in Reno was my, my uh, you know, I had been in 2006, I, Back then, you had to, if you're a top seed, you had to, to lose twice. And I did lose twice, and that was really heartbreaking for me. And then I was able to make the show in 2008, and uh, it didn't come, you know, I think I finished second or third that, that year. So 2009 and back in Reno, um, you know, it was, uh, that was a dream come true. And, uh, because of, that was one of the, at the time, one of the tournaments on my bucket list, I ended up getting a tattoo on, my, on the back of my neck for that. So I still, still, I always know that the date of that of my first, uh, my first Queens title. But um, you know, any any major, especially the Queens, has you know always been one of the, the ladies' most prestigious tournament, and uh, been uh, very proud to be a part of that for so many years, and to be to you know, become that elite group to to win uh, one and win the second title was uh, it's pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, that went in 2009, uh, qualifying over at the National Bowling Stadium, and then uh, basically a special, specially built uh, four-lane venue over right next door at the Reno Event Center. Uh, that was a very cool atmosphere, obviously. Uh, you mentioned 
or we talked about, uh, or in the clip that talked about Market Square Arena winning that first one. Uh, so it seems like you really like those big venues and uh, getting to compete in that environment. Yeah, it's it's a different, it's definitely a different environment. You got, uh, and you going from uh, the, a bowling center to an arena setting is you know so much different. Um, just because it's the same pattern, uh, they they made us play just total opposite because those are they're different uh, panels they're putting in and and approaches. And then you got the whole setting with you know people that are probably literally on top of you, like their eyes are are on top of you and. And uh, that makes, uh, I guess, mentally that much that much harder as well as the physical standpoint. So, um, you know, you just you always have to try to find a way to tune that up. But it just make it makes uh, our atmosphere, our, our sport, that that much more exciting. And again, I'm very, I'm very um, proud to be able to, to be a part of, of those type of settings. Now, one final uh, parallel here to the um, Ultimate Queens Bracket Challenge. As we mentioned, you're up against Shannon O'Keefe. And uh, there have definitely been some memorable matches over the past few years. And, you know, obviously you two have kind of uh, held reign as player of the year, you for three years, and then her the last two. So uh, if you have a most memorable match against Shannon, uh, what would that be? Probably, um, I've had some, some really good matches against Shannon, but probably – had to be the 2015 U.S. Open in New Jersey. Um, you know, they, they I remember that that particular U.S. Open, the scores were pretty low. The, the shots were really, really tough. And, uh, you know, got to the final match, and it was toward the end of the of, of the match. And I fell. I, I, uh, I think I was down a few. And she got up and struck in the ninth frame, and the dude was Mark, and she washed out and wrapped the, you know, the head pin right around the 10 pin and, and I just who sounds, you know, piece of cake, you know, you just got to go up and mark, but for as tough as that shot was, it was, I mean, you just, you don't, you know, just try to hit the one three pocket and uh, uh, somehow I did. And then there, I think I, I fell off the four pin, picked it up, but I still need to count. And again, you know, you, you miss by a half a half a board on, on that type of pattern, that tournament um, at that time. You know, you're it's it's make or break, and I got lucky and got the count and just had enough pins. So that that was probably the one of the probably the best matches, um, that t- toughest matches against her that I've been a part of. And that was a true turning point for Shannon, of course, in in regards to her career and using that that loss as motivation uh, for her to to do what she's doing now. Um, along with Shannon, you've had many other, I'm sure, great opponents. Um, during your career, I'm, I'm curious, which players over the course of your career do you or have you enjoyed competing against kind of the most? I'm sorry, I, I couldn't. No, no problem. Which players uh, across your career uh, have you enjoyed competing against the most? So when you, you know, think back to obviously the first iteration of the tour and uh, to what we have now, of course, since the relaunch, uh, name some players who you've enjoyed competing against and always have some great matches against. My sound is bad. The, um, the, the important moments, you mean? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I can't. Oh, you're good. No problem. Can you hear me now? My sound is um, going in and out here. Um, I've had um, I've had some un- unbelievable moments um, back on tour. Um, the fact that I was, I've been able to, to uh, I think it was eight or ten titles, they said, um, since been since being back on tour, um, winning, it's still amazing. I've, I've won four years since in a row, little, you know, six total. So, um, but you got so much great talent out there. Um, they, some of the young girls out there just are, are the way they fall, just ridiculous. And then, um, you know, Shannon will keep winning player of the year the last two years. Um, you know, nothing's going to stop her as well. You know, she's is uh, she's um, has momentum. Has uh, you know, we all have the drive to. Uh, after being off these these months and everything, and who knows when we'll be able to get back. And 
we just want to get back and um, everyone's going to have that drive. Everyone's going to be so hungry to get back, um, to get back on the tour. So um, hopefully, uh, hopefully sometime soon. Let's check. Uh, Aaron, can you, or let's see if Liz can hear you, Aaron. Testing, one, two, three, testing. Can you hear me? We, we can, can hear you, yes. Can you hear us? I, I can, it's just, it's uh, skipping, like the sound is skipping. I don't know if it's my internet or our connection or what. Those are the fun parts of live shows, is... Uh, <laughs> And podcasting in general, if uh, I apologize we know, if I oh, no worries. Asked me one thing, and I totally. Uh, it's okay. That was really that was a really good answer, though. <laughs> uh, all right, we'll try one more time. So the original question was: uh, players like Shannon O'Keefe, other tough opponents. I'm sure you've had throughout your career. Um, name a few of those players that you've always enjoyed competing against. Well, again. There's so many great competitors out there. Is that when you the when you bowl against the the higher the competition you bowl against, especially the young girls coming out, it really drives you to be to keep going and really um, really step up your game a little bit. Um, you know, uh, Diana, Daria, uh, bowling against Shannon O'Keefe, um, who's just like again, she's had a phenomenal couple of years. Um, Shample, how we've had some good matches and, and always had a good, uh, you know, a lot of com a lot of great matches on TV as well. Um, uh, Daria, uh, Kelly, I mean Kelly and I have had some um, probably some classic uh, matches on TV. Uh, the Players Championship, the U.S. Open, the Queens. Uh, I can name umpteen amount of people that. Uh, yeah, it's it's um, you know. They always, they always want to step, make you step up your game that much more. And I'm not saying uh, maybe the, some of the girls that had as much experience won't. But you always, uh, when you get out there, you're always going to do 100%. I don't care if it's Chris Barnes or Shannon O'Keefe or Kelly Kulik or the person that you've never heard of before um that you're bowling against on tv or a match always treat that person like they're the best bowler in the world and that's going to step up your game that much more you have you have to do that if you want to be the best and, and win every single time or want yourself to win every single time or or at least do the best you can you don't ever underestimate your opponent and that's how i've always tried to treat um you know going into matches and, and going on tv It has worked quite well. <laughs> um, we, we kind of started the show uh, talking about the, your success in the U.S. Women's Open. Uh, obviously, you know, a very tough tournament to win just to put yourself in position to win. Uh, you've done it six times, uh, including, as we talked about, a stretch of four consecutive years in a row. Uh, but out of those six USWO titles, uh, is there a particular favorite out of them? That what? What was the last one? Oh, uh, uh, from your six U.S. Women's Open titles, uh, do you have a particular favorite from the six? Um, they're all my favorites. Uh, they're all <laughs> good answer. <laughs> um, yeah, it's um, every single one of them was maybe a little bit different. Um, the first U.S. Open, of course, was special. That was my first singles title. Uh, young rookie is 22 years old and in finals at market square arena arena setting uh the second one uh, 2007 was in reno and we bowled uh it was a little different format and we waited whoever made the top four we had to wait literally wait to come back to reno and it was that was a bracket format so that was definitely probably the most unique format of of them all and then uh, 2013, Columbus, Ohio, uh, we were bowling in three different centers. And then match play was in a different center. So, again, I guess that was a, another unique U.S. Open. So I was, again, very, very, very proud of that one because that was one of – I mean, they're all tough. But that was it was just a, a very unique format. 
um, 2015, probably the shot was as hard as they had ever been. Um, again, going back to uh, how I, I beat Shannon in the final on that one. Um, 2016, uh, it was, I believe it was in Addison, Illinois. Mm -hmm. um, I came back to meet the show, and then I climbed the ladder to win. So, again, uh, I can't, you know, it's uh, not nothing came easy. I mean, I, I worked hard every single one, of course. And then Dallas, and I had some success in, in Dallas as well. And, uh, you know, that was another great, um, I think I, I climbed the ladder on that one. And uh, they were, uh, maybe the shot was a little softer and scores were a little bit higher, but sometimes scores being higher doesn't make any um, any easier as well because you still have to strike with the best of them. So, um, so everyone, uh, I guess in my head, I, I do remember in some way, um, but uh, they're all... They're all difficult and, uh, you know, proud to say, you know, that I was able to come up on top on every single one of them. So last year, of course, in uh, Louisville, you, you were facing uh, Dasha, of course, in the, in the title match. And uh, Dasha, of course, shot 300. But you were the first person to greet her kind of coming off the approach. Uh, I'm curious if you wouldn't mind sharing just what you told her kind of in that moment um, after obviously she had made history and something that you're familiar with doing on TV as well. Yeah. I, I couldn't believe I cried like a little baby for her. I couldn't even get up on the approach one <laughs> after she was done. Um, I just, I mean, she's, I mean, she has such a great future. You know, she's a great kid. You know, she's, she's just a sweetheart and she's so funny, but when she came off the approach, I mean, I just, you know, just, I congratulated her and just said, you know, I was so proud of her. I, mean, I think that's that was pretty much it. And then, uh, yeah, and then had to throw my shot. So I was just I was very proud of her. She she just made some great shots that day. I wish I could have bowled a little on 50, but um, you know, just to get there is you know usually an accomplishment, and then you know, it happens. So. Yeah, I know there's a uh, from our from our photographer usually for the events, uh, Greg Elman. There was a, a great shot of Dasha's last shot where uh, you, you were actually out of your chair, kind of peering around, watching it as well. So it's it's you know as much as uh, we want to be competitors, there, there's still always a little fan in everybody. So uh, I, I thought that was just uh, such a cool moment to, to to see your excitement for her in that moment, even though you know it was an, a losing effort, uh, but. Yeah, I think that was one of, definitely one of the yeah. shots of the season that, uh, you know, really speaks to the volume of just the camaraderie and, uh, you know, just the atmosphere out on tour that everybody is cheering for everybody. There's definitely a, a, a community within the PWBA tour. Yeah. I mean, you have, you have to be happy for her. You have, I mean, I was in that her position, you know, many years ago. And uh, again, she's, you know, such a great great person and has such a great future and couldn't be anything but happy for her. So. Speaking of that, uh, uh, it wasn't that long ago too, by the way. Uh, so, so you shoot 300 in uh, 2001, but it was very unique, very unique circumstances. Uh, so if you could take us back to, um, you know, 2001, when that happened and, and, and what was going on and uh, it was a bit different, you know, regards to the TV show and how it was filmed, et cetera. Yeah, we, um, that was the September 11th, uh, that happened, I believe on a Tuesday and, uh, we had just literally started match play that morning. It was, uh, nine o'clock we were in Davie, Florida and, um, you know, we all stopped, of course, we're watching the TV and then it came on where, you know, we had a big medium. Do we go on or we do not go on? And they, um, we played on and then we. Didn't, I believe we didn't bowl that Wednesday, and they said uh, we're going to have the TV finals, but it's just going to be one of the guys uh, came in and brought one camera. It wasn't, you know, it was just a very quiet um, finals. I don't want to say TV show, but it was a TV, or it was a finals. And uh, we had a big uh, bonus um, at that time. Travel Lodge was, was giving away uh, $50,000. And, um, you know, we had the finals and I shot, shot the 300 and found out about an hour later that 
even just for the one camera, I still got the fifty thousand dollar bonus. And my, you know, my stomach dropped, and um, yeah, it was it was pretty surreal and it was scary. I mean, it, I was I, lucky in a way that uh, didn't have to get on a plane. I uh, had to drive home from uh, Florida that that week, so um, but I was never so happy at that point as well. It was, a, it was a scary time. It was, uh, I believe we were the only sport in the country that uh, still competed. So. Yeah, we were able to find this clip of the, uh, of the highlights from, the, from that one cameraman. So uh, if everything goes right, we're going to see that. Maybe you could give us a little play-by-play -play here, Liz. With the match and championship already secured, the tension mounted as Liz stepped up in the 10th frame, looking to become only the third woman to roll a 300 game in the step ladder finals and hoping to collect the treble of $50,000. Her first two shots in the 10th were textbooks, sending all 10 into the pit, and then it was time for the final shot. For $50,000. Everyone froze as it appeared the ball might fall in the channel, but it hung on and made a turn to the pocket, completing bowling's perfection, a 300 game. She defeated Carolyn Doran Ballard, 300 to 226. About in that. addition to the there first place is. check and trophy given to her by Bill Petty and Joe Schumacher, Liz received a $50,000 check from Travelodge Hotels for her 300 game. Wow. I don't know. I got chills okay. there. <laughs> wow. I mean, uh, I had <laughs> yes, yes, indeed. Uh, just what was the, what did CDB say after, uh, after you, you guys got done and you shoot 300? What's, what did she tell you? What did she do? Yeah. What did, what did, uh, uh, what did Carolyn tell you after? Oh, um, nice. Just congratulations, and you know, it was, it was pretty awesome. Um, we you know, again, we still couldn't believe, uh, you know, that happened. And uh, unfortunately, unfortunately for her, that was I was the second person to have a 300 shot against her. And fell from in '97. Not that she wants to be reminded of that, but uh, yeah, poor thing. She made she made every single show that year too. I won four times, seven. So, you know, you, you feel bad, but he did okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good point. He had a pretty amazing year as well. So. I think that's uh, that's kind of a cool statistic of that 2001 season when you uh, obviously Carolyn's seven wins jumps out, but I believe you and Cara Honeychurch also had four wins each that year. So that was uh, you know yeah. a lot of folks uh, a lot of folks winning, but Carolyn just uh, just, just found a way to keep winning more. That was uh, definitely a cool time. Yeah, I think Carolyn that year made uh, almost every show except for one or two, maybe. Mm -hmm. She was she was on a roll. She was on quite the roll. Well, that's something you've uh, you spent some time on the said roll once or twice in your uh, in your historic career, and uh, obviously one of the big wins came in 2017. And I'll kind of throw it to Emil to kind of uh, talk a little bit about that because uh, he got to experience that with you. Uh, but a question we asked uh, Kelly earlier this week on the podcast was: uh, obviously, you and her are the only uh, players to uh, win on the PBA tour uh, from the current group of players out there right now, who do you think uh, kind of has, uh, has the right game, has the right mentality to join you two and, uh, you know, potentially win a PBA tour title in the future? Um, which players do you think? Mm-hmm. Yep. Players? Um, I, you know, some of the younger players, you know, Danielle's got a, you know she's got many many more titles to win and she's she's pulled on on the men's tour and she's uh in fact i believe at the last world series she made the cut and of course they had to get um 
you know, to get cut short. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. she's made some cuts for, for the, the PA stop. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't bat, uh, be surprised if, if she was the next female to, to win a title. Um, as well as Diana Z Zavlava. Um, she's, she, you know, she's bowled on, on the men's tour a few times as well. And Maria Rodriguez as well. Yeah, both they all have great futures, and I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't be surprised any one of those three. Very cool, uh, Emil. I'll uh, throw it to you now. Uh, in two thousand seventeen, uh, when we found out that Liz was Lynn, Liz made the show, uh, you, you got the opportunity to go out there as part of the PWBA crew to uh, kind of chronicle that event for her, and of course, obviously, ending in the victory. Uh, for you, what was that experience like? Uh, it was it was great. It was first and foremost, I was obviously happy that we, I got approved to go um, because you know it was kind of last minute. Obviously, once you know you're following the progress and you don't know what's going to happen, so you can't really book ahead. So you know the the flight price was well more than what we normally would be approved for. <laughs> so <laughs> that was the first thing. So they 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 let me go, and then um, it was kind of the first time I really felt like. Uh, you know, we cover the PWBA and we've covered many events, obviously, across Poland. But it was like I, I felt like I was covering um, a, you know, the finals, the World Series, the the Super Bowl, because you know, it was just me, you know, and I got to, you know, put some plans together and figure out ways to, to have Liz engage with the fans. Uh, I remember having lunch with Liz. I think we did it at the um, at the Silver Legacy uh, Legacy. Yeah, in the restaurant there, and like she had like four or five people come up and ask her for an autograph during during the lunch portion. Um, so you know, it, it was I was very happy to see obviously that players recognized her or fans recognized her, and then you know they also knew what was going on. They knew that she uh, was was in the process of potentially making history just across the street, and then you know being there for it, um, getting the chance to to write the story and do some video and you know, really be a part of what is a historical moment is something for me that I will, I will never forget. It will always be a part of my top moments as a, as a USBC PWBA, uh, you know, communications or media writer, if you will. Um, I'll ask you, Liz, what was, what was some of the favorite moments, um, for you? Actually, one more thing I will say, uh, she was getting a lesson or at least a, a little small practice session with Mike Jazz now. So she let me hang out. Uh, with, with Mike and, and her while she was practicing. And uh, I remember Wes Malott coming up. And, um, you know, so I just briefly chatted with Wes. And uh, everyone was kind of kind of honed in. And I don't think she missed during this practice session. Like, you know, she was just kind of getting warmed up, just just tuning up. But I don't, I don't think she missed once. Uh, and I got some audio, actually, from, from Wes. And he was just talking about the greatness of Liz. And he, he was not surprised or shocked that she was – uh, in this position and, and certainly had a chance to win and she did. Um, so Liz, what was some of the favorite moments for you, uh, during that, during that time at that world series? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. What was some of those, uh, some of the favorite moments for you during that, uh, that world series? Oh yeah, I mean, uh, I'm sorry. The um, Reno, going back to Reno, has always um, I've had some a lot of success over the years at, in Reno. So going back there was like it's almost like a, a backyard tournament for me. And uh, I've had I've been very fortunate to have a lot of success at the Reno Stadium. So being in that atmosphere uh, for I believe it was almost two weeks at, for the World Series, and probably had the best World Series um, ever. As far as and and being being able to make that show and and winning it, one having to to strike out in the tenth frame on the um, in the first match and then winning in the second match uh, the way I did um, probably I mean I can't take away any of my other titles but that was probably in in, in my opinion the icing on the cake for my career. Um, being able to win uh, a PBA title, um, and uh, again, just being able to step up uh, to strike when you need to strike, was, um, that was pretty special. And uh, having the audience that uh, that was there, and 
being able to, you know, have you, like you said, uh, being able to cover uh, the World Series the way you did, and um, just the whole atmosphere was was a pretty very special week to put it uh, mildly, I guess. Here we got a few questions in the chat. Uh, I think we want to answer or, or get to a few, and then we'll save a couple for perhaps at the end of the broadcast. Um, so we got some questions for you, Liz, and these are from uh, those who are currently watching in the chat, and they watch Bold TV and the PWB all the time. So the first one is from uh, our good man, Hosan, who uh, I believe is still in Hong Kong, who woke up very early to watch this uh, and, to, and to ask a question. Uh, so his question is, uh, what will, what's the first thing, uh, or I should say, what will Liz uh, do with the first time you're back uh, against practice, I'm sorry, in practice when you can bowl? So um, kind of what's the first thing from a practice perspective that you would do uh, when we can bowl again? From a practice perspective, when mm -hmm. I, when we bowl again. Mm -hmm. So what's uh, and, and and if you won't mind, share a little bit of your practice routine uh, when when you can bowl again. Um, just be able to, to step on the lanes and and be able to walk five five steps to the foul line. <laughs> and hopefully, I can still throw a ball, and, and uh, I'm probably going to have to put a lot of tape in my balls. In my equipment to uh, be able to throw it, but you know, to be able to, to that time when we're when we're going to be able to, to throw a ball again will just be you know it'll be a great feeling, and um, hopefully it'll be uh, just hopefully be sometime soon. Um, I've been I've been throwing bowling ball for four, and uh, you know I don't want it to be done yet. So um, you know, just uh, you know, you get that feeling of. Uh, throwing, throwing a bone ball 60 feet down the lane is, you know, it, it, I feel like it's it's been a part of me for, for my whole life and uh, to have, you know, being taken away from me just doesn't seem right. So I'll be definitely looking forward to, uh, to doing that again. All right. Uh, Chris Pulliam asks, uh, he said he just has one question, and he's read and knows that you are an outstanding athlete and that uh, you are a star softball player. Uh, back in the day. So his question is, which Major League Baseball team do you support? Which Major League Baseball team do I like? Yes. Uh, I'm a Yankees fan. <laughs> I knew the answer, but I wanted you to say it just for Chris. I'm a Cubs fan. <laughs> well, yeah, that's... That's that's where you went wrong. I love Kasha though. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm married a Cubs fan, so uh, actually we have some masks coming. Ones ones of the Yankees and ones for the Cubs. So good, very cool. Um, let's see. Well, we'll get to one Got more. To compromise. <laughs> yes, indeed. Yes. Uh, Chris is a Dodgers fan, so uh, I don't know how he'll feel knowing that you are a Yankees fan. I guess he'll feel okay about it. Uh, let's see. And then one more question from Hosan. Uh, he said, basically, you have won you know, just about every title. We talked about the PBA. You've uh, added a, a Lucy title, the PBA, PWA striking against breast cancer. You've won on the World Bowling Tour. Um, is the Tour Championship the title that would be kind of on your, your bucket list that you would like to cross off? The tour championships? Yeah. Would that be the title that uh, is, is left on your bucket list to, to achieve at this point? Um, I think right now a bucket list championship would just to, to win another title. Um, I feel like I've, I've you know, I have, uh, I have t 10 majors. I have 20 finals overall. Mm -hmm. I was able to get that PBA title. Um, very proud to say I'm a Peterson champion. Uh, yes, you are. <laughs> but, uh, and I, you know, having uh, and I say and have the uh, you know the team gold medals and stuff like that. So I guess my bucket list now could be um, you know just winning another other championship and hope you know hopefully to get back on the tour in the near future. And uh, you know I just want to be at the top of the winner's circle again. 
All right, we'll save our other questions and uh, till the end of the show. So if you have any more, please uh, drop those in the chat. So we'll get to yours, uh, Denny, and if anyone else has any more questions for Liz. All right, Aaron? Uh, you mentioned uh, Team Golds with Team USA and obviously a very uh, storied career wearing the red, white, and blue. And we've had a few of your teammates on the show so far. And when we kind of talk about favorite Team USA moments, uh, everyone who's been involved in the 2015 World Championship has mentioned your 300 to uh, cap the uh, gold medal team victory. Uh, so first off, we have that clip. So I want to go back to that just so we can relive that because I think there were a few uh, interesting moments with that as well. So uh, let's uh, bring in another clip here in just a moment. I think we're going to start off with the 11th shot here. So this is what the front 10 Team USA has already locked up the gold medal. Great shot. Oh my, another strike. And Liz Johnson has got the front 11. 2015 World Championships, Abu Dhabi. We forgot about the volume warning. <laughs> <laughs> Team USA that was is going to win the gold medal here at the World Championships. And the cameraman just <laughs> squeaked the chair. Oh, wow. <laughs> and so Liz, again. <laughs> she peeled the moon. <laughs> so she'll reset here. I think at that point I was just trying to keep my eyes dry. <laughs> Is that from, you knew you had locked points. up the gold medal at that point? All right, here we go. Team USA yeah. has got the gold medal in the books. Liz Johnson trying to make a perfect game. And here it is. Liz Johnson delivers the 300. And Team USA wins the gold medal here in Abu Dhabi. Congratulations, Team USA. Liz Johnson, a perfect 300 game as the Americans claim the gold medal in the coveted five-player team event. What a moment for Team USA and Liz Johnson. 300 to close it out. And the USA chant fills the Khalifa International Bowling Center. 1168 to 1060. Team USA wins the gold medal. Yeah, I think I get chills watching it every time. I've, I've watched it a few times. I don't know, ten times probably. Watched it. <laughs> so it, uh, still couldn't believe you know, it finished the way it, it did. Um, that was a dream of ours, obviously, for winning winning the team. That's where you go in there for is to win the team gold. And those were. Uh... Some amazing shots. I believe you stepped off on the uh, when I was when I was reviewing the video before. Uh, you stepped off before the eleventh shot too. So you, you had multiple resets in that tenth frame. But uh, but yeah, I, I I think just the uh, just the atmosphere of, of there was a noise. The there noise, was a noise yeah. or something in between. I think it was the tenth or eleventh shot or eleventh, twelfth. I remember now. And uh, kind of stepped back and. Uh, Kind of had a laugh, you know, take a breath and kind of laugh about it. You know, what you can do, it happens, and you know, whatnot. And I think everyone was kind of, he had to have a little chuckle, and I think it gave me a little extra, extra breath, you know, to make a to make a good shot. Because you know, we knew we won at that point. Yeah, I was uh, winning at that point. It was just a matter of, you know, what my game, you know, can I shoot 300? It was, was going to be, you know, you know, keep my eyes dry enough so I wouldn't, uh, you know. <laughs> go through the face or, you know, throw it in the gutter or something, something like that. So um, just keep, keep it in front of me and then uh, make an aggressive shot, and that's what I did. And, you know, I couldn't ask for, you know, a better, you know, storybook ending, I guess you can call it, um, at the end of, uh, of that in my uh, in the Team USA career. 
Certainly a legendary moment. And uh, uh, yes, about a month or two later, the announcement uh, that you were retiring from the team. Uh, but you, you had given so much to the program, and I know you were kind of putting more focus on the PWBA. Um, but, uh, you know, and, look, and looking at that team, and obviously there's been so many great players on Team USA over the years, but uh, in, the, in the heart of the last dance, and we've uh, been following that, I've been talking a little bit about that on the podcast, and uh, obviously Michael Jordan, part of the dream team in 1992, that great uh, group of athletes. So uh, if you had to put together a Team USA dream team, who would be on that team? From from like the nineties, you mean? Uh from all time. All time. Or whoever bowl. you would whoever Maybe you would want to bowl. All yep. Time. Um I had I think uh what did I pick here? Um you know, Wendy McPherson was, you know, one of my, my favorites, uh, you know, in the nineties. Uh Leah Sill. Um of course Kelly. I mean Kelly can't say enough Kelly. You know, she she can do it all as well. And Carolyn, Carolyn, and uh, Leanne, Leanne Holsenberg. You know, those those were my favorites. Uh, being around, uh, you know, I grew up watching them, but I also bowled against them and became friends with them. And uh, you know, they're great people on and off the lanes. And um, you know, I can't say enough about them as well. And uh, I think that would be a pretty darn good dream team as well. I would agree, one hundred percent. I would, yeah, I would, I would definitely take that team. Um, you know, uh, with some previous podcasts, we've got into uh, to kind of talks about mentors, and you know, when new players or young players come on tour, uh, you know, some veterans tend to reach out and uh, offer advice. You were mentioned a couple of times in the, in the most in a couple of recent podcasts, as well as uh, just someone who is is uh, you know open to being. Uh, or, or should say reaching out and, and lending a helping hand or offering some advice. When you went out on tour as a rookie, who were some of the players that, that uh, helped you kind of find your way as you were beginning your PWBA tour journey? Um, Michelle Mullen was one of my, uh, became one of my good friends when I first went on tour. I met her through when I was with Team USA the first time. She was one of the coaches, and we became friends. And uh, she ended up actually ended up being one of my roommates my second year on tour. But uh, she gave me a lot of good good advice. She, you know, she was a great bowler and a true champion. Um, Tish Johnson uh, really helped me a lot um, when I first started up. She she uh, helped me with, with equipment and uh, the do's and the don'ts when we were on tour and everything like that. She became like my big sister to me um, on tour. So, um, yeah, she was, she was one, of, one of the ones that really, really helped me as well. And uh, Carol Norman, to this day, is still one of my best friends. And, you know, we talk, you know, we talk all the time. And uh, she drills my equipment. And, uh, but she, she helped me off, off the lane, on and off the lanes as well. And, uh, you know, it was her and Rob Romeo, Jeannie Nacco. Um, you, you just learn the do's and don'ts uh, on the lanes, you know, and, uh, you know, you just learned, you really learn to respect them. Uh, if you didn't respect them, it was, uh, you know, a little different story. But, no, it was, uh, they're great people. Um, and, and I always, you know, I always looked up to them. Um, Growing up to be around them and and then getting to know them uh, was a different respect and um, and I was very very proud to to say that I knew them and you know uh, I was I was um, very happy to be a part of the you know in the mid um, mid late nineties. Very cool stuff right there, Liz, and um, you know obviously. Uh, kind, of, kind of talking about that, uh, one of the questions we had saved up for you was, uh, uh, you know, maybe a, fav uh, a favorite travel story while on tour. Uh, obviously, uh, I think one of the things you probably learned along the way was, uh, you know, navigating the week-to-week -week challenges of uh, tour life. So uh, do you have any great travel stories uh, you'd like to share with Bull TV viewers? Um, well, back then you didn't have a uh, little, I guess, you know, we're now I, I don't mind traveling. You know, I can get in a car and travel by myself. I had GPS. Back then, you had to, you had 
I guess your your navigators uh, sat next to you, and you know you had the trip ticks, and you know you had to uh, you know your, your entries by by mail and stuff like that. You had to, but um, it was, sometimes it was an adventure uh, traveling from city to city just because you, you know you had to you had to learn how to read a map. So, but we had um, a couple, uh, you know, a few of us that are animal lovers um, on tour. Michelle Mullen, and I was. Uh, traveling with her and you know picked up i think she picked up, uh chocolate lab we were somewhere and there was um you know uh, i don't remember where we were at maybe indiana or something like that she she picked up a chocolate lab when we were on tour but uh another time is um myself my roommate at the time sue jesiorski and michelle mullen she was driving us to the bowling center we were in delaware and we saw this uh, husky get hit on the side of the, on the road. And it looked like a, a little helicopter. So we, um, she dropped us off, went to, you know, picked up the dog. And this dog was probably 20, 30 pounds, the poor thing. And, um, and then she took it home and uh, raised it and ended up being 100 pounds. <laughs> so, um, picked up a dog when we were we were on tour um we also i think it was michelle mullen and i and a couple of our other roommates we got in a really bad car accident in uh, nashville um it was my i think it was my second year on tour and uh, again we didn't have none of us really i think half of us probably had phones back then and we didn't, you know, GPS and stuff like that. Some of us got, um, you know, we had to go to the hospital and stuff like that. We were just very, very, very lucky in the middle of, I think, Nashville on a Friday, Friday afternoon at like five o'clock. I'm like, I'm never driving down Nashville. <laughs> you know, I get this uh, sense of uh, I'm never going to drive in bad traffic like that on a Friday afternoon ever again. But, uh, you know, just lessons learned and, um, you know, everyone's safe and, everyone's you know uh nothing nothing crazy um you know um i think one time i was rooming with uh a room with lisa bishop she was you know a great bowler you know the first time out and um again we have you know you don't have gps we're, we're i think going from ohio through indianapolis and uh we end up going the wrong way on what was that big loop in Indianapolis? Is that the 270? No, the 465. Oh, 465, yeah. In, uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, the 465 in Indianapolis is not very small. It's, so we went north and going south, and we went all the way around Indianapolis. We weren't paying attention to what we were doing. And, you know, at that point, you just we couldn't stop laughing. We were just, we couldn't believe we did that. But, you know, everyone, again, everyone was safe. And, you know, um, one more, uh, I will say, my very first tournament um, was Terre Haute, Indiana, 1996. Um, I was driving a Windstar, and back then it was um, it was February. We traveled to four week, three week swings in February, first week of February. My very first week up, it was ten or fifth below zero, and back then a lot of them, probably about six or seven ladies, had uh, motorhomes. Well, all their homes, they froze. My van in the morning wouldn't start, and it was just, you know, how do people, how do they do this? It was like fro literally the frozen tundra, <laughs> you know. So that, you know, that was my first week, and then I'm like after that week, I'm like, I want, I just want to go back home. I mean, I, I can't even, I can't even drive my car, you know, till the afternoon because the car wouldn't start. Every my car wouldn't start until I got to like I think above zero that week. And then after that, it was fine. But, um, you know, just little things like that. Nothing too crazy that happened to me on tour. Um, you know, again, everyone was safe and, you know, uh, nothing nothing too crazy. But uh, I had some good times. And, uh, you know, you learned a lot. You learned a lot about yourself. You know, love traveling. And um, good thing I could create a map back then, too. So you, know, you definitely <laughs> learned that. What would you say is one of the... Uh, most important lessons you've learned, you know, during those times that that has carried or stuck with you throughout, uh, even to your point in your career. 
at this moment? Uh, a certain time or a person? Uh, any any lessons? Like, what do you think the one of the most important lessons that you've learned, uh, or that you learned when you were a rookie or early on in your career that you've carried over uh, to this point in your career? Um, just being out there and being with, uh, you know, your peers. You just learned. Um, you learn respect. You learn to be, you know, to be a good person on and off the lanes. And, uh, you know, you just, you just try to be the best person you can, you know, you bowl, you bowl, um, you may, you may have a bad day and you know what, there are people out there, they're having worse day and, uh, you just try to be a good person and be the best person you can. And, and, uh, you never know when it may not be, you know, it's not going to be a good day or not going to, you know, uh, something like this happens. So, um. A lot of people that are just a lot less fortunate, and uh, you meet a lot of amazing. Uh, I've met a lot of amazing people um, over the years. Uh, you know, they they come in and and they just they appreciate you, and it's like wow. I mean, I can't believe you know I can do this for somebody. So you just it's a very humbling experience knowing that someone comes in just to see you or it's just so you know you, they tell you that you've made their day so you just uh appreciate every single day that you can you know and you know being here and being at home and you know i want to go see my family and right now it's it's it's, it's you know not going to happen so you know i'm very fortunate i can i can talk to my I talk to my mom and dad every single day and making sure they're doing a and um, you just gotta appreciate every single day, live to the fullest, and um, you know, I'm glad I still have my health and, and my happiness. Of course, uh, we're hitting right around the hour mark, so I think we got about two more questions saved up for you, Liz, and then we'll go back to the Bull TV chat. Uh, when we were talking to Kelly earlier this week, uh, she had talked about a um, particularly for her U.S. Women's Open win in Reno under the uh, Reno arches. She said she kept the bowling ball and she actually, uh, the guys from Kegel gave her some of the sand that had, had accumulated on the lane. Uh, so I was curious, uh, you know, have there been any bowling balls or, you know, other type of memorabilia memorabilia that you've saved from, you know, a particular win? Uh, or do you kind of like to collect things like that? Or is it, uh, you know, just like collecting those trophies? Um still have i believe um it's at my parents house i still have my first u.s open bowling ball um it's a uh, it's signed it's it's signed says 1996 u.s open i signed my name and uh, i still have that and i don't know about the grip i go to put my hand in the ball and my fingers like that <laughs> how did i have a soda well it's not exactly in one piece but it's got a big crack like the, you can see the core of the ball um, I also have a, uh, the ball, my biggest, uh, series, um, when I bowled masters in 2007, uh, I shot 843 and the match was against, and, um, I still have that ball. It was, uh, it was actually a couple days before my grandpa, my grandfather was a big, big fan and, and he bowled and has had a, uh, New York state title in the 50s and before he passed away so I had that ball and there's a couple others um, I have uh, back to I think I I, I think I was talked to Leanne on, on the phone I won the title against her in 2002 uh, Ebonite uh, tournament uh, against Leanne it was um, I think I was Pelagian um, I still have so I have I've probably like four or five balls that I've won from the titles I've won um, the, going back to the uh, the one in Davie, Florida, um, I went to save it and somebody stole it. Oh wow! I was I was so bummed about that because I, I think I had already signed it too, and somebody took it. So wow! But I have a couple couple of them so Well, whoever out there, if you're listening, we need to get Liz Johnson her bowling ball back from 2001 uh, in yes. Davie, Florida. So let's let's put out an APB out. On that bowling ball. <laughs> um, I did, did save the A 
one in uh, Reno too. You mentioned the uh, the 843. Who was who was that against? What's that? You mentioned uh, you shot 843. I think at the Masters you said. Uh, who was that against? We missed that part. Uh, I shot against Tony Reyes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. He knows a little yeah. bit some about 300 on TV as well. Very true. Yeah. All right, Emil, do you want to get back to a uh, question or two we still had in the chat? Yes. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, this question is from uh, Coach Denny. He coaches a high school uh, girls team. And his question was, uh, do you have any thoughts um, about the transition from uh, kind of high school bowling to college bowling? So I think essentially yeah, if you could give any advice on uh, to young players as – as they get to uh, transition to each level, whether it's from high school to college to then, you know, hopefully professional ranks, what advice would you give high school players in that sense? Well, make sure they have uh, equipment for all different lanes, uh, for dry lanes, uh, something medium, medium conditions, uh, like a benchmark ball and stuff for heavier oil, maybe a couple other balls in between and make sure no matter what have a plastic ball maybe a urethane but a plastic ball um i remember growing up i didn't have i don't think i used a plastic ball until i was um probably out of high school um but i was i think i had urethane back then too so they didn't have reactive till i was out. <laughs> but uh, a lot of a lot of maybe kids uh, girls um think that they could throw hard enough at corner pins or at spares um but always give yourself uh, keep an open mind always give yourself that option to have you know the straight you know the, the urethane i would say plastic over urethane because still is going to hook a little bit um but definitely you definitely need a ball for every condition the short medium and long and then one or two balls in between those you know between the medium and the and the long and the medium and the short that's a great answer uh he had a second question and uh essentially are there any particular injuries that you know he should be on the lookout for for essentially maybe injuries that young athletes may be you know prone to that they may not know um for example I know for me, just off the bat, I would. Catch. I'm sorry, I didn't. Oh, no problem. I would think about wrist injuries. Uh, he asked, were there any particular injuries that uh, he should be on the lookout for, for just in regards to young athletes, uh, you know, making sure that they don't do certain things that could potentially injure themselves? Well, um, definitely, uh, I've had I've had uh, lower back injuries. Um, I've had a little bit of tendonitis, and of course I'm still battling a little bit of knee arthritis and, and tendonitis and stuff like that. So, you know, before, after um, stretching and doing exercises and just trying to keep keep limber. Um, uh, stretching is always very important um, before and probably after after bowling as well. So. Um, I uh, probably most of my life I've had uh, lower back injuries and just, uh, you know, try to uh, strengthen it or um, keep moving, walking, um, maybe, I don't know how much running, but walking and just a lot of stretching, a lot of stretching and just try to, uh, uh, I've learned all the, um, and I've seen a lot of girls use it, the, uh, those rollers, the foam rollers. Um, those are, are extremely helpful with uh, when you want to stretch and, and try to get those muscles moving before uh, before practice or before uh, bowling a competition. And uh, you just can't, I've learned, you just can't go into this. You get up on the approach, you put your hand in the ball and go. It's uh, sometimes it just some extra uh, time if you do that and you don't want to get injured and get the, you know, you're moving while those muscles are so cold. So, um, 
My stretching is, is very important. All right. Last question comes from uh, Hosan, and it is, uh, is there any, is there one shot, basically, uh, when you think across your career, is there one shot that you wish you could have back that you get to, that you could redo, essentially? A wish that I could have back? Yeah, one shot across your career that you, that you wish you could take back. Um... I was say on in my career, I was, I mean, I've always been a very, um, probably, definitely a little more step back and very shy. And early on in my career, I guess I didn't realize that, you know, I could really, I could win. I could win as much as I could, as I did later on in my career. And I was very scared. Um, when I was probably in my early 20s, no, you know, my people um really knew that but i was scared to once i got to that level like if i made tv i was almost scared to win because you know i was so shy i didn't want to be in front of a camera you know what was going to happen if i win i'm like i don't know what i'm going to say i don't want to say the wrong thing um i think as i clear i just you know you know People make mistakes not on purpose. You know, they they say that you say the wrong thing, you say the, the wrong thing. It's not, you know, it's not um, the end of the world. So, you know, you, everybody messes up every once in a while. So, I think I just learned that um, there are times when, you know, I could have made a show, I could have made a cut. I didn't care if I didn't make it, you know, because I could, you know, go on my way. So. Sometimes I, there was a couple of times where I think I could have made a show. Or I could have made that cut and kept going. And it's not like I didn't care, but maybe I didn't give it 100% or as much as um, effort as I should have. And sometimes I regret that part. But other than that, I'm, um, you know, I would never take back anything I've ever done or, or do now. And uh, I think that's why I just, I may sound like a bro. But if I ever say, like, um, like I don't, uh, you never know when this is going to happen again. You never know when you're going to win again. You never know when you're going to make another show. That's why I'll say that, because that person back then would have just said, okay, you didn't get, oh, well, you just move on. You know, now I'm just that much more hungry to make a show or, or win. Excellent answer. Great, that is great philosophy. Nice, nice question there, Hosan. Uh, thanks for uh, Hosan, Denny, Chris, and uh, everyone else watching, of course, on Bowl TV. It's time for the Aaron Smith question, I believe, right? Uh, yeah, I think we're getting to the end of the show here. So, Liz, uh, this has kind of been our, our ending question for everybody. So, uh, in these quarantine times, what has been the uh, Liz, John or Liz Johnson binge watch recommendation? Uh, if you had to let the folks know what you're, uh, what you're viewing right now. Well, we, we just got done watching Ozark. Oh. Um, that was... The horror is probably not my favorite, but you couldn't just put it down. You know, it's, <laughs> it was pretty it was pretty crazy. Um, we just got that last week. Um, in the morning, or, you know, probably from 9 o'clock to, like, 1 o'clock in the morning, um, Friends is always on. So... I can never get sick of watching them, no matter how. I probably see the episode now twice, and every single time you watch an episode, especially any of the Thanksgiving episodes, you can't like not laugh. So <laughs> it's uh, they're all funny, and you, you know it's it falls, falls, friends is on. So that's been my go-to, and and I'm uh, I don't know if I'm proud or proud to say I still watch daytime TV. I'm, I've been a soap opera fan since I was, you know, seven or eight years old. I, I attribute that to mom or I say it's mom's fault, but um, so I still watch that sometimes if I'm home or during, you know, during the, the day. Um, I don't know if I should be proud to say that or not, but, you know, it's probably that generation that, you know, soap operas were the thing. Really, so. Are you watching uh, General Hospital? 
Dental hospital days were alive. They're, they're, they're as far fetched as they come, but you know, it's it's an addiction that I'm probably mo- not most proud of. But my uh, my grandmother used to uh, have me watch soaps with her when I was a kid. So she would make coffee. She'd give me a small sip, and then we just basically watch from eleven to three. It was like Young and the Restless at eleven, then All My Children at noon. Then one life to live at one, and then General Hospital at two. So, like eleven to three was I was with Grandma. <laughs> then she'd let me watch what I wanted to watch after that. Oh, that's fantastic! <laughs> yes. Uh, so yeah, a, a, a small tidbit about my my childhood. <laughs> Any uh, final thoughts, Aaron Smith? I. Uh, no, I'm just, uh, once again, very thankful for another awesome guest. Liz, thank you for uh, taking some time out to join us here on the Bull, or excuse me, on the PWBA podcast on Bull TV. Uh, so, you know, obviously we're, we, wish, we wish we were out on the lanes with you right now, but uh, hopefully that time is, uh, is coming up very soon. And uh, continue to take care of yourself, and we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. Thanks a lot, guys. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks, E. Thanks for having me. You're welcome. Uh, please send our best to Kasha, and I uh, hope you guys are, are staying safe. And uh, we will see every one of you folks next week on Bowl TV, uh, the PWBA podcast. Actually, you heard uh, Liz kind of mention Leanne a little bit, and we'll be uh, happy to welcome Leanne Holsenberg to the podcast on Monday. Uh, we'll also have Dasha Kovalova next week on Wednesday as well. So two great guests as the PWBA podcast rolls on. So for Aaron Smith, Liz Johnson, my name is Emil Williams Jr. This has been episode uh, number 12 of the PWBA podcast right here on Bowl TV. Stay safe, folks.